Imagine being taken from your home of 40 years, separated from your wife and kids, and dumped in a city on the other side of the world. But for Mitchell, the biggest challenge is just getting around Phnom Penh. On his tiny moped, navigating the narrow, dusty streets, traffic coming from every direction. It's a big change from the wide roads and empty highways of Wisconsin, the only place he knew his home until a few months ago. It's hot. <laughs> traffic is crazy. I mean, going anywhere, I'm not used to this. No, hardly any stoplights, no one respect anything with the driving, people going the wrong way. So it's, it's really difficult transportation-wise. Now home is a small apartment in the Cambodian capital. Clean and tidy, but little more than basic furniture and boxes of water. The possessions he had accumulated over 40 years in America, all squashed into one small suitcase. It's really hard. It just, it's just a nightmare. It's just been a nightmare. It's still a nightmare for me here because I, I don't know really how to function yet because I'm not used to this. You know, I'm used to America. Mitchell was repatriated from the United States, the only country he's ever known as home. But after living the American dream, he made one mistake. I had you know, marijuana, so they charged me with possession of intent to deliver. And that was the biggest mistake of my life. And, you know, it turned my life and my family life upside down because of this. Instead of being released when the sentence was complete, he was taken by the Immigration Enforcement Service, ICE. Despite growing up in the U.S., he'd never got full citizenship. And the price for his crime was deportation. But why, in the 40 years you were in the United States, didn't you apply for American citizenship? Yep, yep, I could apply. I could apply at any time over there, but I just never thought of it. I thought that this is the country that I'm going to live in for the rest of my life here, and I thought I was, you know, and part of an American, you know, country. In the mid-70s, Cambodia was torn apart by civil war and famine. As the brutal Khmer Rouge took control, hundreds of thousands fled. Mitchell's parents and their one-year-old son escaped with their lives and little else. Since 1981, Mitchell lived exclusively in the States. Unlike other Cambodian refugees who struggled to adapt, he thrived. He worked hard at school, graduating from college with a good degree, and had several management jobs. He even volunteered as a social worker, helping children with disabilities. His was the American dream, an immigrant who adapted and developed in their new environment, and now it's all gone. Everything is strange. So how does it feel like going from nice air-conditioned supermarkets to this? It's scary. I mean, I personally don't buy anything from here it's just because it's not refrigerated. You know, I'm not used to eating anything that's not refrigerated. So I, I go to a, a supermarket. Expensive. It's, a little, it's a lot more, but at least you get it refrigerated, not something that's sitting out in the sun for eight hours, and I can't do it. So, and all the flies and everything all over, so, yeah. But Mitchell has one big advantage in this dramatic life change. When his family fled, other relatives remained. A widowed aunt and several cousins run a small restaurant business out in the suburbs. What they sell, they sell the bread. I think he knows what it is. Uh, the sandwich with the meat, just like Vietnam and all that stuff, and they're prepping condiments for it. Yeah, so it's the mom, she comes on and help them because they, they get really overworked. I mean, at two o'clock, their you know, customers start coming. They're just busy all the time. He didn't know the family until he arrived. Many ties were broken during the Khmer Rouge years, but the family bond is strong. But this is the way I usually eat every day. I mean, they, they want me here every day, and if I don't come, they get mad, and, you know, but... Yeah, yeah. They worry about me being there alone, and, you know, maybe I don't eat right or something, so they want to make sure I have food. And but Mitchell does look awkward and out of place. He speaks basic Khmer, but it's littered with English words. He's bigger than his Cambodian relatives, and he looks awkward and cramped in the little shop. It's an awkwardness that's very apparent to his family. 
He shows them pictures from back home on his phone. It's a world away from the life he's living now. Reminders of the life he left behind are everywhere in a fast developing Cambodia. Mitchell does occasionally allow himself a little taste of home if he can afford it. But when speaking to other Americans, he keeps his past under wraps. It, it does feel weird because then they want to know what you're doing here and then you kind of make up your little story because you kind of keep it on the hush hush. It. The Cambodian returnee program has been in operation since 2002. But since 2016, the numbers sent back have increased dramatically. And the U.S. Immigration Services are tracking nearly 2,000 Cambodians with criminal records. The Trump administration's goal of reducing immigration isn't only targeting those who cross the border illegally. Anyone with a green card who commits a felony faces deportation, even for relatively minor offenses such as Mitchell's marijuana possession. But Cambodians are particularly vulnerable because many never changed their original status as refugees, and many found it difficult to assimilate into American life. For those unlucky enough to get sent back, things have improved, however. For the returnees being sent back today, things aren't nearly as difficult as they used to be. Cambodia has opened up enormously. Millions of tourists come in every year, and many ordinary Cambodians speak very good English. But for the first group that was sent back in 2002, it was a very different story. Charlie was one of the first to come back in 2003. For many years, he struggled, isolated and angry that he'd been expelled from the land he considered home. You have to have a strong mind, and you have to accept the fact that it's messed up what the U.S. did, but it is what it is. You, know, you got to move on. This is your life now. But Charlie picked himself up and now works at a center for new returnees like Mitchell, helping them to adjust, find work, and learn new skills. As we speak, other returnees lie quietly in their bunks. Although this is only supposed to be temporary accommodation, many choose to stay longer, unable to adapt to their new life. When they do socialize, many prefer their own company, split between two different cultures. The locals find their tattoos and Western ways intimidating, making it hard to fit in. Really, our mind is Americanized. You get what I'm to come here is a whole different atmosphere, whole different attitude. You know what I mean? It's hard to adjust. And while meetings like this help ease the change, the pain of being separated from their loved ones never goes away. When they hold me, they took me on the bus and took me to the holding tank and sent me off to Cambodia. No, they didn't tell my family or nothing. Nothing. For Mitchell, the hardest thing is leaving his family behind, especially his two-year-old daughter. He's already got presents for her when, or if, she manages to visit. She's pretty confused. She's very, very confused because she doesn't even know what to say every day. She's like, oh, daddy, daddy. You know, sometimes she call me. Her mom is washing dishes and she pick up the phone. She know how to call me. So she'll call and just wanted to say, daddy, love you, daddy. And and he hasn't given up the possibility that a pardon might allow him to return. I'm hoping there would be some chance. And, you know, from the way things are looking, you know, there's always a chance. But how great is it? I, I don't know, you know. That chance is slim, though. Since 2002, only one Cambodian returnee has ever been permitted to go home to the U.S. Even religion is little consolation. Mitchell grew up surrounded by Buddhism, but it means little to him. I have no clue what all this means, you know. I don't know who, what represents what here and who's the higher up or anything like that or anything. I, maybe I should start learning. But that faith may well lead to his being reunited with his parents, if not in life, then in death. My mother is here, you know, she's deceased she passed away in about 1998 
my dad brought her urn and her ashes here back about 10, 15 years ago. They, they brought her back here, so, you know, and my dad wanted to be kept here too when he passed. So. And so Mitchell is condemned to continue walking the streets of this unfamiliar city, a stranger in a strange land, but one which he now calls home.